Good day to you. I'm here today to talk about a uh, Lee Metford carbine, cavalry carbine, which was presented to a soldier who won the Victoria Cross. It's not every day that you get to touch or handle a rifle uh, to a man who's won the VC, and I certainly feel quite honoured to be able to hold this and talk to you about it. Uh, it's, for your information, it's a uh, Lee Metford, as I said, cavalry carbine. It's a Mark I, dated 1896, and it was uh, built at Enfield. So this is the early model with the um, Metford rifling, not the later with the Enfield rifling. So this uh, carbine was presented to the commanding officer of the 18th Hussars during the Boer War. His name was Sir Percival Scrope Marling, and his initials are actually here on the wrist of the butt. He was born in Gloucestershire in 1861 to uh, the landed gentry. He was certainly uh, from aristocracy. Um, he went to school at Harrow and also at the Royal Military Academy, Academy at Sandhurst, where he uh, graduated as an officer. In 1880, he joined the 3rd King's Royal Rifle Corps, the 3rd 60th King's Royal Rifle Corps, and within two months, uh, he was aboard a ship and they sailed for South Africa. He was to take part in the First Boer War of 1880 to 1881. I think he must have had quite a rude baptism of fire because the first uh, battle that he was involved in was the first battle of that war at Lane's Neck, uh, where the British attacked the Boers who were uh, trenched uh, on the top of a hill. The British lost quite heavily. They lost around about 80 killed in action and many more wounded in action. Uh, a few weeks later, there was another battle at a place called Ngogo, or the Ngogo River, or also called Skeins uh, In this instance, uh, the Brits were surrounded by some sharp shooting Boers, again, and uh, they lost heavily, uh, around about 70 killed in action and, and many wounded. The final battle of that short war uh, was at a place called Majuba Hill uh, in February 1881. What happened was uh, a British force, a mixed British force of about three different regiments, uh, scaled the Majuba Hill under Sir George Colley, who was a general in command in, in Natal. Uh, they scaled this mountain and they were observed by the Boers who were down in the, in the, in the flats below and within uh, the, the whole day the Boers had crept up this mountain and they attacked the British on the top of the mountain. Uh, it was a fierce battle and the Boers were using, I might add, uh, more obsolete weapons. The British had Martini Henrys, the Boers had monkey tails and Wesley Richards uh, number two muskets and things like that. Some even had sniders. Uh, the end result was that 92 British soldiers were killed 131 were wounded, and I think there were 56 taken POW. Conversely, the Boers lost one man killed and six wounded, one of whom later died. So just to repeat, uh, 92 British killed in action versus one Boer, and that pretty much speaks for itself. Uh, the war ended, uh, there was a change of government in the UK, and they decided to make peace with the Boers, and the Transvaal, or the ZOR, was given back limited independence, which is what the Boers wanted. Uh, within two or three months, uh, Marling was on, uh, on the move again. Uh, he and his regiment went to the Sudan, to Egypt and then the Sudan. Uh, there was war uh, from 1882 in Egypt and right through in the Sudan for the next five or six years. In fact, as you will see, Marling has five different clasps on his Egypt medal showing the different campaigns that he took part in. Uh, in 1884, on the 13th of March, um, he was involved in an action at a place called Tamai in the Sudan. And I will read you the citation for his Victoria Cross, if you'll just bear with me. For his conspicuous bravery at the Battle of Tamai on the 13th of March last, in risking his life to save that of Private Morley, Royal Sussex Regiment, who, having been shot, was lifted and placed in front of Lieutenant Marling on his horse. Morley fell off almost immediately when Lieutenant Marling dismounted and gave up his horse for the purpose of carrying off Private Morley. The enemy pressing close to onto them until they succeeded in carrying him about 80 yards to a place of comparative safety. Marling spent some time in the Sudan and Egypt and as I mentioned he was involved in quite a few campaigns. Uh, at that stage he transferred to the 3rd 60th, the King's Royal Rifle Corps Mounted Infantry Company. Uh, he'd been with them for, for a couple more years, and in 1886 uh, he's approached and offered a troop in the 18th Hussars. So it's a big decision for him, but he gets a promotion and he moves from the 3rd 60th to the 18th Hussars, which is a famous old cavalry regiment 
and I might add the sword behind me is a pattern 1890 British cavalry sword, uh, cavalry trooper sword, uh, which was definitely used in the likes of the Sedan and also in the Boer War, which we'll be talking about very shortly. So he moves over to the 18th Hussars, uh, posted back to the UK, he spends a bit of time in Ireland, uh, and then he heads back to India with the 18th Hussars. While he's in India, he gets another offer of a uh, promotion to be sent down to Australia. And there's quite a bit of information reported in the Sydney newspapers, the, uh, the Sydney Mail, Morning Herald, etc., where it says there's a specie winner, uh, Sir uh, Percival Scrope Marling, uh, has been offered the job as the Commandant of the Cavalry Training School in Sydney. So he was offered this job uh, with the local rank of Commandant, um, and they are all very excited about the fact that this is a, very, a heroic gentleman uh, who's seen a lot of service and they're looking forward to him taking up this post uh, for, for three years it was in Sydney. Now it so happens that later on uh, in his life Marling wrote, his, uh, wrote a book which is called Rifleman and Hussar and in this book he mentions most decidedly that he did go to Australia in 1894 which was the year after he was offered this position. Funnily enough, he doesn't mention the fact that he was uh, at the cavalry school in Sydney. So I'm not quite sure if in fact he did take up that post. But he goes back to, uh, after Australia, he goes back to India and then from India back to the UK. While he's in the UK, um, shortly after arriving there, he hears rumours about rumblings in South Africa in the old Transvaal, which is where he was before. So he finds out that in fact uh, there's a good likelihood of war breaking out against the Boers. So what he does is he jumps on a ship, um, this is in August 1899, this time he takes his wife with him and they sail for Cape Town. He gets to Cape Town and he puts up in the Lord uh, Mount Nelson Hotel, which is a very prestigious hotel in Cape Town, and he also adds, by the way, that he had dinner with Dr Leander Starr Jamison. He was a gentleman who had the infamous Jamison raid in 1896. He makes his way up, this is Marling, uh, from Cape Town up to, to Durban, and then he makes his way up to Ladysmith. And the gentleman who is in charge of the British troops in the Tau happens to be General Penn Simmons, who we've spoken about before. In actual fact, the uh, video we did some months ago, the Five Battle Mauser, talks about the battles of Ladysmith and also Talana, which we'll touch on. Uh, Penn Simmons says to Marling, listen, you've been here before during the First Boer War, I'd like you to go and do a reconnaissance. Go and have a look at Lang's Neck, which is on the border between the Transvaal and the Tau, and have a look at Majuba Hill. So Marling selects one of his officers, and off they go uh, in civilian clothes, in Mufti, and they ride up and have a good look around Lang's Neck and Majuba, as I said, right on the border with the, with the ZAR. When he comes back to report to Penn Simmons, he mentions that uh, quite often they, were, they could see Boer farmers with binoculars and telescopes looking at them. So I think the, the Boers had sussed on to the fact that these guys were casing the joint out. Anyway, uh, war broke out on the 11th of October 1899, and by that time the 18th Hussars had been posted to Dundee, which was a small mining village, coal mining village, uh, not that far from Ladysmith. Uh, the first the British knew about the Boers, who'd crept up uh, and, and taken a position on Talana Hill, was a shell burst on the parade ground of the British uh, camp in, uh, in Dundee. So uh, we've gone through this before when, in the Five Battle Mauser, but briefly uh, the British uh, fixed bayonets and charged up to Lana Hill and they managed to dislodge the Boers, uh, having taken a few casualties from their own uh, artillery, I might add. But during this battle, Penn Simmons was actually mortally wounded. Uh, a Boer sniper had a go at him. He was on his horse uh, commanding the troops and telling them what to do when he was mortally wounded. Uh, at the same time, uh, there were two squadrons of 18th Hussars under an officer called Moller, that's M-O-L-L-E-R, who was sent around the back of Talana Hill, supposedly to cut off the Boer retreat, because they knew that once the Boers had left the hill, they would mount their ponies and, 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 and retreat. Well, in fact, what happened was the Boers turned the tables on Moller and his men. Uh, they holed them up in a, in a small farm, and there was a pitch uh, battle or a little skirmish which ensued and the end result was that Moller with 60 of his men and 130 mounted infantry were all captured by the Boers. And the Boers went whooping away with swords and bayonets and all these uh, <coughs> war trophies that they picked off the British. Marling, luckily for him, wasn't in that particular squadron 
So he was elsewhere during the battle, and by the time he got back to uh, Dundee late in the afternoon, they realised that Moller and many of his men were missing, and as I mentioned, they'd all been captured. Um, at this time, I think this is a good uh, point uh, to talk about the uh, carvings, the intricate carvings that are on this, this little carbine. And on the left-hand side, we've got PSM, which are his initials, around the wrist area. And we've also got two uh, ZR coins, they're two shilling coins. You'll see Paul Kruger's head and also the ZR coat of arms, very ne neatly inlet into the, uh, into the woodwork, the timber of the butt. And there are also scrolls above and below which say Boer War and South Africa. Uh, the other thing on this side of the butt is the 18th Hazars cat badge. The other side of the butt, which you'll see, um, is also very interesting. There's the uh, ZAR coat of arms towards the, the butt plate. Uh, then we've also got about six little panels here with scrolls. And in those scrolls are various battles like Talana, Ladysmith, Belfast, etc., which you'll see on the screen. There are also two dates, um, 11th October 1899 and the 31st of May 1902, which was the beginning and the end of the war. Uh, when I first saw this carbine, I immediately recognised the style of the carving. And uh, it's interesting to me anyway, and maybe to yourselves, anyone who has my part two book, Carvings from the Felt Part Two, on page 249 and 250, are two captured Boer M95 Mauser rifles. Both of them have been carved in exactly the same style by the same person uh, that did the carvings on this carbine. And interestingly enough, both of the Boer, captured Boer rifles have got 18 Hazars on them. Uh, they've got the names of the Boer, the Boer recipients. I think one is Prince Lou, and the other one has been incorrectly spelt, Von Trump, I think it is. And also the names of the 18 Hazars. One was a company, a squadron quartermaster sergeant. His name was Marshall, and the other guy's name, I think, was Tucker. So I presume that at the end of the war, uh, the war ended in May 1902. The 18th Hazars didn't leave South Africa for about three to four months. So there would have been plenty of time to actually carve up these trophies, these captured trophies. And I presume somewhere they'd managed to cotton onto this little carbine and they decided to do it up as well uh, and present it to their commanding officer. Uh, Marling was actually mentioned in dispatches in April 1902. And as I said, the war ended in May. Uh, in June 1902, uh, he was uh, awarded the uh, Commander of the Bath, Companion of the Commander of the Bath, CB, so for his services during the war. As I mentioned, uh, the, uh, the 18th Hussars left South Africa and went back to the UK. By the time they went back to the UK, Marling had uh, done about 26 years of service, so he actually uh, resigned and retired. Um, he'd been there for quite a few years, and uh, war clouds started uh, brewing up in, uh, in, in Europe <clears throat> and of course there was war with Germany. Uh, war broke out on the 5th of August uh, 1914 and he gets a telegram from his old commanding officer who was a general uh, in charge of mounted troops and he says, Marling, can you come and join me? So at the age of 54 he dons his uniform again with the rank of lieutenant colonel and off he goes to give the, uh, the general a hand, the general of the mounted uh, cavalry and, and mounted infantry etc. At some stage later on, uh, he sent over to France where the BEF were. This is in 1914. So he qualified for the 1914 Mon Star with a bar. He was sent over with 123 interpreters. Now, quite an unusual command, but I suspect probably uh, because he could speak French. So he went over to the Western Front <clears throat> and in his book, which makes interesting reading, he talks about with all his years of campaigning in South Africa and in the Sudan, uh, and all the, the fighting that he'd actually seen, he said he'd never ever seen anything quite as, as horrible as, as the fighting in the Western Front. And he actually states that the men lived and died in the trenches like animals. And he said it was absolutely horrendous. And that's quite something coming from a guy who'd seen so much service previously. In his golden years, Marling did a few trips overseas with his wife. He went to South Africa, to India, and also to Australia. We still don't know how the carbine actually arrived in Australia. It remains a bit of a mystery. However, this does represent um, a man who saw a lot of campaigning over many years. I think the carbine oozes history. Marling died at the age of 75 in 1936, and I hope you enjoy the story. <laughs>